Okay, so today what we're going to do, and one of the things that today is the last uh, session, as you know, and one of the things that I've been um, stressing um, extensively is for me, the importance of Muslims teaching history, the, 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 the centrality of learning history, um, which was always something which was part of our um, educational curricula as Muslims. Um, history is something which gives you identity, gives you meaning, and it also gives you an understanding of how you place yourself in the world that you're in. Um, a lot of the challenges that young Muslims are facing today in regards to um, many forms of isms, whether that's nationalism, liberalism, or whatever you, you know, um, racism or whatever it may be, or even ideas of regarding Islamophobia and so forth, come from the fact that um, younger, gen younger Muslims are finding it very difficult to draw back on a repository that's, that's from the past that gives them meaning to make, help them understand their relevance in the world that they live in today. And one of the reasons that is, is because after the formation of the nation states predominantly in World War II, the configuration of the way that we identify um, shifted from um, it being predominantly a religion being the mark of identity to the national state being the mark of identity. In that sense, uh, you can see that while people may identify as being Christian, Muslim, or whatever religion denomination they belong to, nonetheless, there is a particular trauma in their mind of how does that make sense in the world that we live in today. One of the things that I think is important then is not only to understand um, Islam in regards to um, law, ibadat, which is worship, fiqh, and so forth. I think it's still just as important to understand the historical past so that they can understand the journey that um, Muslims have come to, to where they are part of that journey today. So they need to understand they are part of the timeline. They are not an, um, an anomaly in that sense, and they are continuation of something in that sense. And they're part of an ummah that goes back to Rasulullah up until now. So for me, my emphasis has always been on the fact that um, while I appreciate the opportunity given to give these couple of lectures, I think that we need to start to establish ways of teaching history in a more concentrated form, which is in the classroom format. And we have very few academics and Muslim academics in particular that are doing that for the young Muslim youth. And one of the things that I keep hearing in England in particular is we have young children, we want them to learn Islamic history, we don't have any um, avenues to do that for them um, and uh, you know what can we do and I think as a community we, we really need to think about this um, because to, to negate or to ignore the importance of history is to basically fracture a part of their identity which leaves them exceptionally lost um, in the world that they live in right now um, and you can see Muslims want to identify they want to be a part of something this is just the nature of human beings to want to feel affiliated to some sort of collective identity not only uh, an identity of the self in that sense. So I want to stress that that it, um, after these sessions are over, that we as a community start to think of ways of how can we incorporate the learning of history, especially this period of history, which I'm invested in, but you know, all of Islamic history in some shape or form and just history in general, because it is very beneficial in terms of giving a sense of solidity in regards to a basis and a foundation for, for, for many people in that sense. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to what we're going to talk about today. So, I, as I mentioned two weeks ago, one of the challenges the Ottomans had, and this question keeps coming up, which is the idea of the industrialization of, of, of Britain in particular, and why the Ottomans couldn't compete with that. And the main reason is, is because the Ottomans, as a Muslim entity, had a very different culture in the way that it was interacting with its society. And so, um, it, and the reason why I want to explain this to you it's because a lot of people don't understand the Arab revolts and a lot of people don't understand the, um, the fracturing of the Balkans and how that was possible. How did that happen? And it's because the Ottomans didn't use brute force to get their subjects who then became citizens to live under them. It was a continual negotiation between them and various local leaders who were representatives of the local populations. Whereas in the case of India, as you can see, the British used brute force as a way of maintaining loyalty to their, to their subjects in India in that sense. India is really key, and I keep mentioning this and people keep thinking, why am I you know, passing the buck by, to some degree, absolving the Ottomans from any blame by trying to blame India? That's not what I'm trying to do. 
what I'm trying to explain to you is the success of the industrialization of British society was based on the deindustrialization of India. So you have to understand that the, the success of in industrialization was the ability to take resources from India and to then pump it into, into London in that sense. And the Ottomans didn't have, they didn't have that type of resource. They, didn't, they couldn't do that to their own people in that shape and form. They couldn't just extract resources from their people. Islam wouldn't allow it as an ideology and their people were not accustomed to this type of what you could call violent extraction of resources, whether it's on a human level uh, or whether it's on a, a level of just gold, you know, um, and materials in that sense. So the Ottomans were disadvantaged in the sense that while they had the capacity intellectually to replicate forms of technology that the Europeans had, what they didn't have was the capacity to use a particular form of brute force to be able to achieve that success. In the case of France and Britain, um, because they were colonial powers, they, there's the, the nature of rulership was very different in being able to give them the ability to do that. So this is the point I'm trying to make is these were two different empires and they operated in two different ways. The other point that I've always made is about the, the nature of we need to re-examine the decline paradigm in the Ottoman period because Britain was at its height in 1924 when the Ottomans collapsed. And by 1946, Britain had lost India. In 20 years, it lost the, the jewel of its empire. That's a rapid collapse of the British empire and entity. The question is, is when does this British decline uh, begin? We don't really ask that question because the, the point I'm trying to make consistently is that one of the interesting things about states and power and empire is their ability to continuously um, trans, transform and, and reinvent themselves as a way of surviving. And that's an, a constant backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. The point I'm then making is that power in particular is very fragile, but power has to present itself. It has to give a perception that is quite strong. And so power in any moment can collapse and it doesn't necessarily at times require a decline. There can be many incidences that can happen in historical moments where power, powerful entities can just come crashing down as we can see in the case of Britain and France regarding World War I and World War II. Um, and the Ottomans are similar to this because the argument amongst Ottoman historians, and this is what I wanna to stress to Muslims because Muslims keep attacking me that there was a decline and I'm saying my, the, 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 the fraternity, which is the Ottoman fraternity, which is modern contemporary historians are making the argument that this is not the case, that the 19th century was an upward curve that the Ottomans were on their way up. And we see this in the Arab world regarding the Nahda. And we see this in terms of the Reformation in the Ottoman context. So um, people then make the argument about the printed press. The printed press was only significant in the 19th century. It's irrelevant what happens in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Even in the, in, in the West, the printing press was not revolutionary to the point that it, was a, it gave the West, the, the Europeans an advantage over other societies. It's the 19th century where the printing press becomes significant in Western societies. And in the 19th century, the Ottomans and the Muslim world were using the printing press in equal capacity. So it really makes no difference here. So this is all about how Muslims are imagining power and how they, they what the problem is, is because we know the outcome, the outcome is the Ottomans collapsed. As a result of that, then we go back in time and try to join the dots. And we need to be a little careful of that. So now then, World War I, what's interesting about World War I is for the Ottomans, World War I actually begins in the Balkan Wars in 1912, 1913, and not only that, we can say Libya in 1911. So when the, the, the Italians invade Libya, this is a huge shock because it, it basically compromises the Ottomans. And while the Ottomans are trying to deal with the Libyan question, the, in the Balkan provinces, we start to see a movement for independence. This is difficult for the Ottomans because while Libya is an external force attacking the Ottomans, which is the Italians and the Ottomans called it a jihad, in the Balkans, it's their own populations. They're not Muslim populations, but they're still Ottoman subjects or ex-Ottoman subjects. The Ottomans have to deal with them in a different way. And so this fracturing of the Balkans because of the breakdown in communication between the central authority and what was happening in the Balkans because of the intervention, mainly of the Russians, 
but also the Austrians and then the British meant that it became very difficult. So the Ottomans were more or less fighting an internal war in the Balkans um, to try to maintain their uh, suzerainty in the Balkan provinces. They lose large sections of the Balkans uh, as a result of that. And so what you're seeing now is the Ottomans of, have been fighting a war from 1911. So they have begun losing large amounts of troops and resources before the Western powers have in that sense. And the Balkan Wars were very costly for the Ottomans. So in that sense, it's important to recognize that the Ottomans have already gotten involved in a warlike situation prior to World War I happening. And that um, those loss of human um, lives and resources are really important. Now in Turkey, the question is always, why did the Ottomans go on the side of the Germans? And the reason is this, uh, after the murder of the Austrian crown prince, um, Ferdinand, the, um, Serbian nationalists in particular, um, started to have ambitions of extending their borders um, to the detriment of Ottoman influence in the region. And the Ottomans got very nervous about this. The Austrians also got nervous about the, 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 the Serbian expansion in, in the Balkan regions. And this was problematic for the Ottomans and the Austrians. And they were concerned that outside uh, support, mainly by the Russians, was helping the Serbians to facilitate a larger state in that sense. And so the Ottomans, to some degree, are now trying to, to, to figure out how they can, they can curtail this uh, extension. What they start to notice is that they move towards the British in the hope of consolidating a relationship with the British so that um, the situation in the Balkans doesn't spiral out of control. But the British had no interest in forming a relationship with the Ottomans. So one of the reasons, things that we need to understand, the Ottomans predominantly lost wars, even Kuchuk Kainaja, because they were fighting against coalitions. That was the main problems the Ottomans had, that whenever they went to war, they were fighting against states who, who formed coalitions against the Ottomans. And here the Ottomans truly understood that if they didn't find a way of formulating a coalition with somebody, then the next war that impacts the Ottomans is going to be to the detriment of the empire. And so they initially move in the direction of trying to attain some sort of um, assistance from the British, but the British are not interested. Then Jamal Pasha, Jamal Pasha is one of the three Pashas who military men who are um, part of the new CUP government, and he's the governor of Syria. Um, he tries to um, move an attempt to speak to the French the French also ignored him. And the main reason why the French ignored him is because the French did not want to agitate the Russians. The French were well aware of, of their relationship regarding the Russians. And the French, along with the Russians, had some sort of intentions and designs in the Balkans. So the problem the Ottomans have is that they recognize that there is a good possibility that a war is going to begin. The question is, what do we do? Um, and for the Ottomans, they are trying to remain as neutral as possible for as long as possible, but they're realizing that this situation is out of their hands now, and so they have to make particular decisions. Why they moved with the Germans in particular is two reasons. One, the Austrians in particular were making, um, giving out feelers to the Ottomans in particular, that they're willing to, to form a negotiation and establish some sort of coalition with the Ottomans. So for this, the Ottomans found this um, um, beneficial because the Austrians are in the Balkans and they can act as a buffer in the Balkans. Because if you remember, the majority of the wars for the Ottomans that have been taking place have been taking place in the Balkans. Okay, Libya is an exception, but mainly it's the Balkans. The Ottomans don't have this, this, this mindset that they, they're going to lose the Hijaz or anything of that nature. At this moment in time in the war, the assumption is, is that this is going to be probably a short war just like the Balkan Wars has. And so, you know, having a relationship with the Austrians is beneficial. The Austrians have a good relationship with the Germans and the German ambassador then came to speak to Enver Pasha about forming a defensive alliance, not an offensive alliance, but a defensive alliance in which the Ottomans by and large objective was to safeguard their own territory and to restrict the Russian advancement on the Germans. So the Ottomans are under the impression that the Germans would go to war with the Russians and the Ottomans, because of how they're geographically situated, they would stop the Russians using particular what you could call, call tactical areas 
And as a result of that, the Germans as a, a, the emerging power and a very strong power in, in that um, would, could be and, and may be victorious over the Russians and with the Austrians also being involved in this, that the Ottomans, the Austrians and the Germans collectively could squeeze the Russians. And the Ottomans were always concerned about Russian encroachment. What the Ottomans didn't realize or they didn't take into consideration, they didn't anticipate this. And this is part of the problem, which is that they didn't appreciate that part of the German strategy and the Germans didn't tell the Ottomans this, is that they were going to attack France first. So the German, um, the Ottoman assumption was, was that they would, um, they would act as a buffer to stop Russian encroachment. The Germans would attack the Russians. They would um, defeat the Russians. The Austrians would also be uh, in support of that and isolate Russian encroachment into, into Europe and into the Balkans. And that will be how the war would, um, would be won. The Germans, however, came under the impression that the Ottomans would fight the Russians and the Germans would go after France in that sense. They never told the Ottomans this. So here you can start to see that the Germans actually have an offensive strategy and the Ottomans have a defensive strategy. So there is, seems to be some sort of breakdown in communication in regards to what's happening here. Now, what the Ottomans had hoped is that with the defeat of the Russians, the Ottomans can then go back into the Balkans and take everything else back, which they had lost in 1912, 1913. So that was the ambition in that sense, right? So this is why they then created an alliance with the Germans. And also because the Germans were the only European state which were willing to accept the Ottomans on equal footing. Whereas the other European powers continuously wanted to make the Ottomans as a secondary partner, as a submissive partner in that sense, whereas the Germans didn't do that. The Germans actually saw the Ottomans as equal partners in that sense. And what's intriguing is because the Germans um, wanted the Ottomans to get involved in the war because the Germans were under the impression that the Ottomans being the caliphate and being Muslims, that they will be able to rile the subjects in India in particular against the British. So the Germans were hoping and banking on this idea that if the jihad was going to be called, that Muslims globally would move against the British because the Ottoman Empire was being attacked. And this would, this would create a lot of difficulties for the British. And it would be a strategy which would hamper the British to give the Germans the advantage of attacking the French and the Ottomans keeping Russia occupied. Obviously, that was a miscalculation, not only on the German um, perspective, perspective, but that was a miscalculation on the Ottoman perspective, because generally one of the things that's interesting, and this is one thing we can learn, is how do we judge global Muslim public opinion, right? When, when I sometimes speak to certain Muslims who are, um, who are critical of Erdogan, for example, they'll say, if he just made the call for Islam, the Muslims would move. The question is, would they? would they move? I mean, we've seen what's happening in Palestine and Muslims are not moving. So the question is, is why are they not moving? Because generally what we're starting to see is that to make a diagnosis of the global ummah in a sophisticated form is very difficult. It requires a lot of tools and expertise. And so what often um, is internalized is a, a more emotional response it, and in the hope that if the Ummah is attacked, that they would move collectively. But that doesn't always happen. And this didn't happen in World War I um, in that sense. And this caught the Germans and the Ottomans off guard. Now, that's not to say that the Ummah in their pockets weren't supportive. In India, we see this, the emergence of the Khilafat Committee as they start to notice the Ottoman um, advance towards uh, um, the British in particular. The hope was in India that if the Ottomans had succeeded in the war, and there were moments where the Ottomans were succeeding in the war that the, the Muslims in India would get independence from the British and be able to fashion, uh, you know, once again, a new imagination for themselves. This wasn't the case, obviously, with um, the Ottomans losing. And with the Ottomans losing, they created a, a particular form of trauma in the Muslim mindset, the intelligentsia in particular, in regards to putting all the eggs in one basket in trying to support the Ottoman effort. And as a result of that, you start to see the the sort of like imaginations of creating a state for Muslims, which was Pakistan, East Pakistan and West Pakistan to that degree in that sense. So you start to see this is a, a direct um, sort of like you can see um, manifestation of, of World War One, in which the collapse of the Ottomans 
um, not only physically, but intellectually, left a huge gap collectively about what it meant to be Muslim in the world at the time. And what does it mean to now have Muslim authority? And so this is where you start to see the emergence of these thoughts in the Indo-Pak region. So Eric Jan Zurha, who's, um, he has a very good book um, called um, Modern Turkey. And it, it was a response to Bernard Lewis's work. He makes eight points about why the Ottomans got involved in World War I. He says, um, when, he signed it, when the, the Ottomans signed the treaty with the Germans, that they, both parties would remain neutral in any Austrian-Serbian conflict. Um, that if Russia entered the conflict and forced Germany to do so, the Ottoman empires would join on the side of the, of the Germans. Uh, what was interesting is um, um, this, this, this pact would also remain secret to some degree. So um, wh why was, you know, why this change in, in, in mind, knowing that this could lead to war? Well, um, as I said to you before, the Ottomans wanted to be seen as equal partners. And to some degree, um, the, the German offensive caught the Ottomans off guard. When the Germans initiated the wars, the Ottomans still held out. So they still were trying to hold a neutral position. And the Ottomans asked the Germans, that if you're going to now, because of the treaty we've signed with you, going to squeeze us into this war, we're only gonna get involved in this war is if you give us more reinforcements. So the Ottomans put pressure on the Germans to give them more intel, more, more human personnel, and uh, you know, more money to some degree, although it wasn't much, um, as a way of trying to um, pacify and sort of like, um, um, give the Ottomans a sense of satisfaction that, okay, we've got involved in this war, but we've got, we've taken something from the Germans, so we're in a better position today than we were before this war started, in that sense. And the Ottomans were unable to postpone the war once the Germans started their, their offensive. So what the Ottomans tried to do is they tried to stop the Russian offensive coming from uh, the Black Sea. And now you start to see what's interesting is because the Germans had attacked the French, the British got involved because the British were um, you know, um, in a position where they signed a treaty to protect the French if there was ever an offensive on the French in that sense. Uh, the Jihad Fatwa was put out uh, in 1914 by the Sheikh al-Islam. What's interesting here is that the Jihad Fatwa, some historians argue, was put out under um, the, the request of the Germans themselves. The Germans had made the request to put out this Jihad Fatwa. And you can go online and see the Jihad Fatwa. I think I, I, I maybe one of the lecturers mentioned it, um, that the Ottomans made it very clear that any Muslims who supported the, 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 the British or the French forces um, in the fatwa it made the case that um, knowingly or unknowingly that sort of support um, was haram and was unacceptable in that sense. So they were really trying to put pressure on Muslims to stay away from the war effort but the British, um, you know, were using forms of, of what you could colonial force. And so to some degree, uh, Muslim soldiers really had no choice. And this is interesting because in England in particular, when there are celebrations of many Muslim soldiers who are fighting in World War I, we don't see the backstory of that. They, they really, the backstory is taken away in the sense that they are celebrated um, in the sense of being part of the empire. Although we're even seeing with the Gurkhas right now, the complaints that they are not being treated equally. But what you saw in World War I is they were not seen in equal footing in the eyes of the British by the empire. To some degree, they, they, these were slave soldiers. They, they, there wasn't a choice given here. This was, um, they, it was forced recruitment in that sense. And the Ottomans also tried to do some form of what you call coercion in trying to insist on soldiers from the Arab provinces to fight for the Ottomans. And it was very difficult. It was very difficult to convince people to fight for them because you can't force people to fight for you. And this is part of the tensions that I want you to understand between the Arabs and the Ottomans in that, in that sense, where the Ottomans, um, the human resources, because the majority of the soldiers were from Anatolia. So the Ottomans are now trying to use multiple mechanisms to convince local leaders to get more Arabs into the armed forces to fight for the Ottomans, whereas the Arabs are under the impression that this is not going to be a long war, this war is going to be mainly fought in the Balkans and in Anatolia. The Arab provinces will be, will be safe and fine. And we shouldn't totally invest all our men into the, this war effort. And then everyone's going to be a loser. So they were holding back in the, under the assumption that this is not going to be a long war, just like what happened in the Balkans. And that's because Arab soldiers were sent in the Balkan wars in 1912 and 1913. And 
it, it, it had some problematic elements to it in that sense, in terms of the disconnect between the Ottoman soldiers from the Arab provinces in Anatolia who were fighting in, in, in the Balkans. So the point I'm trying to make here is um, people often say, why didn't these soldiers just, just do? Because society doesn't work like that. And what we see in the Ottoman context is that there was a, there was a level of freedom in Muslim society in the Ottoman world that they had the ability to, um, to, to rebel and, and reject central authorities' command for them to, to, to fight in that sense. And one of the things that's not well understood often, I feel, by Muslims is how, um, how the Ottomans um, tried to negotiate with their Muslim populations when they had to go to war to try to get soldiers to fight in the war. It's not that easy convincing your population to continuously fight all the time in that sense. And while there is an assumption that, you know, this is a religious duty and that should be sufficient, that's not how real life works, unfortunately. So uh, Enver, what he tried to do then is he attempted to catch the Russians out um, by pushing his men in the north to try to fight the Russians in the north, and which nobody had won this offensive in the past. And, you know, from 90,000 men, only 12,000 survived. Many of them died in the snow because they didn't have the, the conditions and, and uh, the sort of like um, um, equipment and apparatus to deal with a war of that nature. I mean, people have always made the argument that even Napoleon failed in regards to fighting the Russians in the snow. But what Enver's mentality was, was that we are holding a defensive war strategy and now it's possibly um, is better to have an offensive war strategy and try to gain back um, the Crimea, for example, and parts of the, the land. And we're in this war now, let's just go for it. So they went for broke. But a lot of men had died. The other thing that the Ottomans were nervous about, and we'll probably touch on to this, is um, the Russian advance in, in supporting the Armenians. And the Ottomans became very nervous about uh, Armenian collusion sorry, um, with the Russians. And so as a result of that, um, one of the things that the Ottomans decided was to move the Armenians from where they were situated in Van and so forth and bring them more inland into Syria uh, and parts of Mesopotamia in that sense and keep them out of um, what you would call the um, Russian influence. There is no denying that um, in that movement, a lot of people died, there was a lot of misplacement and there was a lot of infighting in which um, a lot of Armenians had been killed. Muslims also had been killed, but with with the fact that the, 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 the government was, was more powerful than the population, far more Armenians had died than, than, than Muslims in that sense. There is still a contention point between um, Ottoman historians uh, about the situation, and it's very loaded regarding the question of genocide, um, because the word genocide has become politicized to some degree. Um, and so in that sense, the question is, is there still seems to be a contestation regarding the sources, regarding the numbers, and regarding the evolution of the term genocide um, in, in that sense. So mo most mainstream Turkish academics reject the idea that this was a genocide, accepting it was a massacre, but then suggesting it was warlike conditions. Whereas in the West in particular, not every academic in the West, um, you've got Justin McCarthy, for example, who rejected it was a genocide. Even Bernard Lewis, surprisingly, um, uh, was unwilling to call it a genocide. So it's interesting. Um, how this plays out. But there's a lot of um, um, debates on the genocide um, question. Um, I personally haven't invested much time on it because that wasn't an area of interest of mine, but it's still a contentious point amongst Ottoman historians. And I don't think we're going to get a straight answer either way. And that, that, that just, I have to be honest with you here um, in that sense, because I feel to some degree that even the archival material is compromised to some degree. So, um, another thing that then what the Ottomans realized is Russian encroachment, the loss of, of men against uh, the Russians, the British encroachment in the Arab provinces, and the Ottomans fighting the war on multiple fronts. And this became very difficult for the Ottomans. Whereas initially the assumption was, was that it may be um, blocking the Russian advancement from one aspect or maintaining a particular um, uh, war in the Balkan provinces, this became a, in a trenched warfare. And this totally changed the game for everybody, for the British, for the French, for the Russians and the Ottomans. This type of trench warfare now was that, you, um, you know, um, soldiers were going to stick around and it was just survival of the fittest. 
an uh, option that went through some of the Ottoman generals' mind was the idea of turning this into guerrilla warfare, the idea of inviting um, or allowing um, the, the Western force, the British forces, shall I say, and the French forces to come into the particular Ottoman cities, making them assume they've taken the city and then turn it into a messy warfare to force them to leave. But this would have been very detrimental on the population at the time. So they did use this type of guerrilla warfare in Libya, and they did use it in parts of, of the Balkans, but it became very tricky to do this. And guerrilla warfare was usually a, um, a sign, an indication when you had uh, less physical uh, men to be able to compete um, on the, uh, um, against a, a more um, a force with more superior numbers in that sense. Um, so the Ottomans then decide that we're going to take the Suez, okay? And what's interesting is uh, the Ottomans failed twice to mobilize Egyptians against the British um, in that sense. And then the, the British had managed to mobilize a large uh, force from the Indian division that came from India in the Gulf region. So now the Ottomans are on the back foot because a huge division has come from the Gulf. And then the, the, the British forces are, um, are, are drawing from Australia and New Zealand, bringing in more forces to reinforce their war effort um, against the Ottomans. And then in 1917, the Ottoman forces, which are spread thin, the British take Baghdad, which was a humongous shock, actually. People seem to assume that the shock of losing Mecca, Medina, or, 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 or Quds was, was a huge blow. But actually, when we look at the data, the Ottomans were far more traumatized by the loss of Baghdad, because Baghdad was one seen as the caliphate of the Abbasids, and the Ottomans were seen as the successors of the Abbasids. But also, Baghdad was so strategic regarding the Hijaz in that sense, um, that the loss of Baghdad strategically in the war meant that the Hijaz was now exposed and there was a possible unraveling that could take place. And so the Ottomans are now very concerned. But at the same time, what's interesting and people don't realize is the Ottomans had defeated the British twice in Gaza. So there was an upward turn in the war as well. So while there is the loss of Baghdad, there's also the defeat of the British in, 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 in Gaza and Palestine. And so what's interesting is um, the newspapers at the time is almost like watching a cricket match. When, when my mom is watching cricket with me, she goes, who's winning? And I'm saying, well, Pakistan are batting. He goes, what does that mean exactly? I said, it looks like they're doing all right. And so what I'm trying to say here is that in this war, it was very difficult to know from day to day which side was being victorious. So, so much of the war effort was based on propaganda, the propaganda machinery of trying to pump out information to, to kill the morale of the opposition that this particular side was winning. What's interesting is because the British won, sorry, won the war, we often as historians then look at all the British propaganda and make the assumption that they were continuously winning all the time. But this is not necessarily the case. Just like Lawrence of Arabia um, was, uh, was, was, had infiltrated particular factions in the, in, in, in the Arab world in the side of the British, the Ottomans had sent people to Afghanistan and India to do the same. And there are um, uh, articles on this actually, that the, the, the Ottomans were successful in Afghanistan and India and sending people over to agitate the local population, especially in Afghanistan um, against uh, the British forces. What's even more interesting is the Ayatollahs in, in, in Karbala in particular signed a fatwa saying that we must fight, uh, telling the Iranians that we must fight along the Ottomans in the war effort. And I was uh, gave a presentation recently on the Ayatollah called Ayatollah al-Naini, um, in the Ottoman records, his name is uh, Al Najafi Naini, and he um, he was a water carrier for the Ottomans, trying to support them in the war effort um, against the British, because the concern they had was that the British and the Russians were far more dangerous in that sense. But what happens to the Ottomans is interesting. A lot of people die of sickness, plague, malaria, cholera, um, because of the contamination of water. The war conditions created the difficulty of, of attaining food and resources. The Ottomans had to make a choice now regarding resources, regarding wheat, that who do we use it for? Do we use it for the soldiers or do we use it for the population? The so, so now you have a conflict where we need to use it for the soldiers because if the soldiers don't survive and win the war, then the population lose out. But by taking food away from the population, public opinion turns against you because the population thinks that the Ottomans are abandoning them um, and, and, and so forth. When we have, um, for example, 
um, the first generation of soldiers are killed, and so many of them are killed. The Ottomans are now creating forced labor to force in soldiers to fight in the war. There's a famous uh, a movie with Feiruz, the, 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 the singer Feiruz, where it was a Lebanese pro production, um, making this movie about how the Ottomans were forcing like Arab soldiers to fight in the war. In reality, the Ottomans had no choice. It's like, if, you, if we don't fight in the war now, we're finished. So you can start to see that the complexity where on the one hand, people don't want to be forced to fight in the war, who wants to fight? But on the other hand, the desperation of needing men to fight in the war in that sense. Um, so this was another problem that the Ottomans had. Um, so in 1917, something interesting happens. While the war is on a, sort of like a seesaw, and we don't know where we're going, the Bolshevik revolution is underway. And the Bolshevik revolution changes everything because the Russians pull out of the war. When the Russians pull out of the war, this is seen as a major victory for the Ottomans, the Austrians and the Germans, because the Russians have totally, there's an internal revolution, they've decided we're out, and there's now a major enemy that's out of the war front. The Ottomans are then able to negotiate with the Russians and they take back many of the lands that they had lost to the Russians um, in that sense. So at this moment in time, the Ottomans are on an upward curve. There's a sign of positivity. In India now, Muslims are very excited and positive that the Ottomans are going to win the war. We're on the upward curve. So once again, as I said, you know, how this war propaganda was operating in that sense. But at the same time, the Ottomans are in a tricky situation because of the Arab revolts. Um, Sharif Hussein was in a difficult situation in, on the one hand. Sharif Hussein was put into power by Sultan Abdul Hamid II. He was born in Istanbul, he, and, and then he's, he's, he goes to, to Mecca and becomes a, um, sort of like the, 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 um, the, the representative of Istanbul there. And when the young Turks come to power, they when they initially come to power, the young Turks want to purge any of the pro-Hamidian politicians that are in the area because they wanted to have men who were more loyal to them. Sharif Hussein was always, always as a result of that, um, apprehensive in terms of his relationship with the young Turks. And so when the war begins, now there's a situation where the young Turks are trying to squeeze him to get him to fight on the side of, of, of the Ottomans. And what Sharif Hussein is basically trying to do is hold a neutral position by, hoping that this war would end any minute now and that he doesn't have to get anybody in the Arab provinces under his sort of authority involved in the war to some degree. At the same time, the British are also speaking to him. But what's interesting is there's a frustration because Sharif Hussein is neither moving towards the British or the Ottomans in that sense, right? So this is what becomes intriguing. Um, the Ottomans then insist on the Arabs to get involved in the jihad. They're making the claim that this is a jihad against the British. You have to start fighting in that sense. Um, and at this moment in time, you see that the Arabs don't have any intentions of creating an Arab caliphate. I need to be very clear here because a lot of times a lot of people attack Ar the, the, the Arabs, and this is like nationalist propaganda, that the Arabs were conspiring to create their own caliphate. This idea comes a lot later once the Ottoman state collapses during the Ottoman period, while it is true that the British were agitating um, the idea of um, the, an Arab caliphate, but Sharif Hussein clearly was not interested in this idea at this moment in time. Um, so we have to be careful with the propaganda that was being put out in the Hamidian period. And then after World War I, when the Arabs start thinking about this question and joining the dots again, there's a particular propaganda machinery by the British in the Hamidian period, but Sharif Hussein by and large is not interested in this question. What Sharif Hussein thinks is going to happen is this, the Ottomans are, are probably going to lose the war. They're going to lose the Balkan provinces. The Arabs will get decentralization, but there will still be a Khalifa in Istanbul. And that's how we're going to operate from now on. And this is going to be a, a different type of empire in that sense. But obviously that, that's not what happens either. So, Sharif Hussein, nervous about Ottoman intentions, is worried about what the Ottomans are going to do to him. And he's concerned that the, somebody amongst the Ottoman ranks is going to assassinate him. So in order to, to survive, he starts to, to, to find information regarding whether this is a possibility or not. In 1916, Jamal Pasha had attained information that there were certain Arabs in Syria who were flirting with the idea of listening to the British. And so as a result of that, he executed a host of notables um, as a way of assuming that by making the case that these were traitors, 
and this is what happens to traitors, that that um, the Syrian society in particular will go in, you know, come into line. Instead, it had the opposite effect. What it had was a local population turning on Jamal Pasha, saying, what, what are you doing? This is unacceptable. And as a result of that, and Jamal Pasha did two rounds of arrest and the execution, Sharif Hussein got very nervous. The point I'm explaining here is I'm not trying to blame one side or the other. It's clear that there is a total breakdown in communication in the war effort. And now every man is trying to fight for himself. It becomes survival of the fittest in that sense. Um, and you can see the Ottoman distrust towards Sharif Hussein and Sharif Hussein's distrust towards the Ottomans. And to some degree, you can see why they both are distrusting each other. And once again, as I said to you before, the way that the Ottoman state operated is it couldn't force people to, 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 to live under them. It always negotiated it. And you see this throughout Islamic history in that sense. So then what happens is um, Jamal Pasha sends, uh, as we know, Fahri Pasha, the famous Fahri Pasha, to defend Medina, um, as Sharif Hussein had now decided to be, to be on the side of the Arab revolt. Um, and this was initially seen as just as a way of sending a warning to the Ottomans. Now, look, this is what we're capable of doing. We can take our cities back just like the Wahhabis did and during the time of um, Selim uh, III and say, listen, look, we, we're from this area. We can take it um, in that sense and letting the Ottomans know that, look, don't push our buttons. But the Ottomans also doubled down um, to some degree. Uh, Fahri Pasha tried to... Um, defend Medina, obviously Mecca was lost. And then um, the only way the, um, the Arab revolt was successful was um, Sharif Hussein turned to the British and the British thought twice whether they should send troops or not, or whether it was worth sending troops or not. In the end, the British did send the troops and as a result, um, that changed. Consequently, um, it's the Germans who, 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 who capitulate in the war. And as a result, the Ottomans totally capitulate in the war in that sense, and the Ottomans now lose the Arab provinces as a result of internal contestation in the Arab provinces, the, um, and the inability to, to save off any of the Arab provinces and the, the occupation of Istanbul. Uh, once Istanbul is occupied, it, it, the game's up in that sense. And in 1918, when the Ottomans lose the war, um, the Ottomans sign an armistice with Mudros, um, suggesting that this is it, the Ottomans are done. The main reason why the, um, the British army was to some degree now successful was the ability of the American forces to double up and then bring over more forces from other parts of their empire to sort of um, help them in that sense. Um, and then what we see, it was interesting is um, the Bolshevik revolution is interesting because when it happens for the first time, we get news of the Sykes and Pico agreement. It's from here that we start to hear Sykes and Pico. And it totally caught Sharif Hussein by surprise. The British had promised him one, one set of, of rules, and yet the British and the French were, were thinking of ways of how to divide up the Arab provinces um, in, in that sense. And, in, in, and you see what happens in the way that the British operate. Um, now, very quickly, because it's a lot of information to cover, and I'm really sorry, and we'll go back to Istanbul in this sense. Now, as a result of that, the Greeks in particular um, and the Italians invade mainland Turkey and they start to occupy places like Bursa and Western Turkey, like Izmir and so forth. This really catches um, the, the Ottomans by surprise. And the frustration and the agitation is, is while the Ottomans and the society could have, have, have had to swallow humble pie at the fact that um, the British had occupied Istanbul, the idea that the Greeks in particular that were ruled well, well, the Ottomans ruled over once were taking parts of Anatolia, that just created a huge um, a wave of resentment and the Ottomans went again um, as a way of fighting the Greeks and getting them out of what you would call today's uh, Anatolia. There's some really interesting stories um, when you read um, Ottoman efforts about particular losses. Um, for example, um, Mehmet Akif makes the argument in one of his poems that um, in sorry in a Juma Kutba in Kastamanu, he said that when Palestine was um, taken by the British forces, the Austrians who were on our side of the war in Vienna, they were celebrating at our loss. There were also reports, um, you see this in the works of Eugene Rogan, that when Istanbul was occupied by the by the British forces, that non-Muslims were celebrating 
as the British were coming into Istanbul in that sense. And so you can see that the sort of resentment that starts to emerge amongst the certain Muslim populations in that sense. And this war becomes very messy because it starts to create fractures between internal populations in of themselves in that sense. The um, now a, a large corpus, um, so Enver Pasha, Jamal Pasha and Talat Pasha, um, they get on the German ship and they are whisked off to, sorry, not Enver. Enver is continuously fighting in Georgia. But Jamal Pasha and, and Talat Pasha and many of the members of the CUP, um, as a result of not being held accountable on, in regards to the Armenian question, they go to Germany and they, the hope is that they can live their lives out in exile there. But Armenian um, revolutionaries killed them in Germany. So what we see is that the initiators of the war and that first generation that were involved in the first part of the war have either died in the war effort or have been killed um, as a result of the loss of the war. And so you have a new generation of the second in command, if you can say, and this is Mustafa Kemal in particular, and his generation of soldiers who start to become um, important. In 1920, when the Ottomans signed the Treaty of Sevres, there's an absolute capitulation, something that... Um, the, the Turkish, the, or the Ottoman military will not accept and tolerate. And so they continue to fight um, and, and they, they fight until they create what we call the borders of today's modern day Turkey. And as a result, there is now another treaty called the Treaty of Lausanne. And it's in the Treaty of Lausanne that the Turkish, the borders of the current Turkish state is accepted. There's a difference in opinion between the government in Istanbul, which is under the British occupation and the government in Ankara in terms of what should be the next um, uh, decision um, to move forward. The government in Istanbul said, let's just accept our losses, maintain what we've got, the empire survives. And the idea probably was, was that the British and the French will not be able to sustain their authority in the region and will get it back. The, the government in Ankara was probably under the impression that this is just like wishful thinking, this is not gonna happen. We need to keep the borders of the Turkey, what we have right now, I'm, we're not interested in the Arab province anymore. It's gone, it's gone. The Balkans is gone, it's gone. This is it. And so you can see this difference of opinion. And so when the Treaty of Lausanne is signed, it's signed within the mindset of um, accepting the realities of the war and then maintaining this particular level of integrity of what they've taken back, which is Turkey, right? In that sense. 1923, the Sultanate is abolished. And then 1924, the caliphate is abolished. And when that happens, you, there's a huge shock. You can see even in Egypt and India, they weren't expecting this. They weren't expecting the abolishment of the caliphate. So why does Mustafa Kemal abolish the caliphate? Because the idea is, or the assumption is, is that for him, it wasn't an issue of religion per se. It was the issue that Sultan Abdul Majid, the caliph, was undermining Mustafa Kemal's authority in Ankara. There were some people who spoke about the idea of Mustafa Kemal becoming caliph, but Ismet Inunu, who had um, um, who was sent to Lausanne in particular, he said, we need to move forward if Turkey is to survive from the clutches of the foreign powers, because you've got to understand they don't have a for they don't have foresight in assuming World War II is going to happen and the British are going to collapse in World War II. What they're seeing is the British have taken all the Arab provinces. This is what we've got right now. Let's just keep Turkey. I'll be very short in two minutes and then we'll end it. I'm sorry about that. So, um, so they formed the Turkish Republic. As a result of that, it's a humongous shock um, to the Muslim population. 1925, we see the Sheikh Said revolt, which is a Kurdish revolt against uh, the Turkish Republic under the basis that Islam was sort of, the, the Turkish Republic was secularizing. You need to understand what the Turkish Republic had become by now. The majority of the male population in Anatolia, 2.5 million men had died, um, had lost their life. And that's humongous because the total population of the Ottoman Empire combined was only 20 million in those days. You've got to understand what the populations were like in the world in that time. Um, there was a huge migration um, in Anatolia um, in that sense. And so the two main um, identities of, of that region was Turks and, and Kurds. So they constructed the Turkish national identity as a way of, of, of fashioning this new state. In 1925, the religious shrines were closed. The dervish tekkes were closed. The laws of maintenance were ordered. The hats were banned. The fezes were banned. Um, and so any person who wore a hat like an alim would have to take it off. Um, and any soldier had to have a hat with a beak on it. 
As a result of that, 7,500 people were arrested and 660 people were executed according to the, um, the numbers by Eric Jan Zorha. By 1926, the European calendar was adopted. The Swiss, Swiss Civil, Civil Code was adopted, and Mussol uh, sorry, the Swiss Civil Code was adopted, and the Penal Code was taken from Mussolini's Italy. Um, in that sense, they banned words of Bey, Effendi, Pasha, all abolished. Um, the Sheikh Islam um, position and cabinet was abolished, and by the 1930s, um, they had secularized family law removed the, the Arabic alphabet and created a, um, a two institutions. One is Turk Tari Kurumu, which is a Turkish history institution and Turk Dil Kurumu, which is Turkish language institution. And these two institutions were designed to, to one, to create a national history of the Turkish Republic and create a new language of the Turkish Republic. Fundamentally, if you look carefully what's happening, the Turkish Republic is gutting out the ulama. The ulama were so deeply entrenched in what was Ottoman. The language is gone, the alphabet is gone, the hats are gone, the tekkes are gone, the positions are gone, the, the Sharia courts are gone, the schools are gone. They're totally trying to clean them out of the system. In the, in, in the sense of the creation of the Turkish Republic, it's a response to what's happened in World War I. But as a result of that, you can see that they went into overdrive to try to make sure that um, um, as a way of surviving, that we have to replicate the European models if we are to move forward. This would not have happened um, prior to that. There's an assumption that it's the secular Young Turks who wanted to do this. The Young Turks were not this radical. Um, in, in many ways, while the Young Turks might have not been all religious, they understood that the machinery was Islamic in that sense. And so you start to see that this is a total sea change in the Turkish Republic. Um, this is... Um, in that sense, a humongous shift um, in, in, in the region and the creation of the nation state. Then what they needed to do was they needed to create a national hero. Mustafa Kemal became that hero and then create symbols around that, create new memories. A younger generation, uh, a, a young population can be easily indoctrinated and the traumas of war meant that they wanted to look forward rather than look back. And so this is how they were able to do that. What we see in the region is up until now though, that this trauma hasn't left them. And so this is what happens in World War I, by and large. Um, yeah, well, um, I know I tried to cover a lot here, um, but you know, this is so much we can still talk about.